Uh, good morning once again. We want to thank the Lord for giving us this chance once again to be able to listen to his word. I'll invite us to pray as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. We want to know more of you and how we pray that uh, you may give us this chance, Lord, just to draw closer to thee. And uh, if there be anything that will occupy our mind that is not essential, we pray that uh, by your miraculous working and with our efforts, Lord, to confine to thy will, that um, you will be able to dispel such a thought. And Lord, help us to think of your word and what Christ is doing in the heavenly sanctuary. And so bless your children as we study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I want to thank the Lord. And uh, yesterday, as we were studying the word of God, we reached somewhere. And that somewhere is where I want us to begin. We left uh, our study where the children of Israel had to go and rebuild the sanctuary. But yet, what was their problem? What was the problem? They were not prepared. They had lived in Babylon for so long until they had come accustomed to the lifestyle of Babylon. And so I want to pick up from where I left in Ezra chapter 8. Ezra chapter 8. And uh, in verse 15, they have been telling the Lord that the time is not yet come. Yet we saw from the law of the prophet that uh, if anyone went into the house of God to do a work and came into conduct with unclean thing, then the vessels that he will touch will also be unclean. And so they needed a purification, a cleansing first before they could handle the materials that were to rebuild the sanctuary. Then we saw that we are lively stone to build the spiritual house. And not only that, but in First Kings chapter 6 and 7, the stones were made in quarry. And when they came to build the sanctuary, no harm was had on it. And so also in our lives, those who are going to rebuild the sanctuary as the spiritual stones, we have to be quarried from the world. In fact, let me remind you something as we go to Ezra chapter 8. God did not allow the Israelites to build the sanctuary in Egypt. Why? Why did God not allow the children of Israel to build a sanctuary in Egypt? Paganism and the lifestyle. Did you just reduce the volume? Paganism and the styles of worship and the sacrifices that could be offered in Egypt was contrary to the Egyptians. Is it so? The Egyptians considered the animals and the things in Egypt, some of the animals that were to be used for sacrifices were so sacred to them that they could not allow the children of Israel to build a sanctuary there and offer those animals. Is it true? So God had to bring them out of Egypt. And our worship won't be accepted in some certain places or in certain environment and so God calls us from those environments so that we may come to a point we may offer that which is acceptable to him. And so he's calling us out of Babylon so that we may be able to offer sacrifices acceptable to him. But when the children of Israel were at the point of going to rebuild the sanctuary in Ezra chapter 8 verse 15, and I gathered them toward 
the river that ran into Ahava and their abode, we intend three days. And I viewed the people and the priest and found there was none of the sons of what? The very people who were to do the work in the sanctuary were not ready to do. The very people were appointed to do the work. And so I'll be coming to the issue of 1888 in one of the presentations. Why has the church, why did the church not receive the message? And why is it today even the church not ready to sound that message at such a time as this? Because there is the repetition of the history. This is the reason we are told that every church member should study the sanctuary and get acquainted to the position of the high priest and the work they are supposed to do so that they may exercise the faith for such a time as this. And that is why we are going through the sanctuary. Today we shall be looking at the candlestick. That is where we have reached. Um, but as I finish this, that the Ezra could not find the priest, but where were the priests? We go to the book of Nehemiah and see what you are being told in Nehemiah chapter 13. This was the problem as we even enter into the study of today. Book of Nehemiah chapter 13. We read from verse 23. If you read there, say Amen. Why was there no priest amongst them? In those days also saw I what? Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and Ammon and who? The very nations that God told that they should not marry from in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7 and chapter 12 are the very nations that they married from. But it is not something to the Lord for the people to condemnate themselves in this way. It is something to God when the ministers enter into such a transaction. So we continue to read verse 24. And their children spake what? Half in the speech of who? And could not speak in the Jewish language, but according to the language of each people. How could they read the book of the law? which was written in the Hebrew language when they could not speak the language itself. And today we have attended so many seminaries, attended so many teachings, until we cannot speak Adventist language, we can only speak what we hear from the seminaries. Yet we have to finish up the work. We are told, and I contended with them and cast them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourself. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations of there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Verse 27, shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? Verse 28, and one of what? Of the sons of the Joiada, the son of who? The high priest was son in law to son Balak, the Hononite, therefore I chased him from me. The priests were condemnated. And they didn't want a cleansing. And so they stagnated the work of God in going forward. But then we are told we have an article in the sanctuary, which is called the candlestick. The very people who want to be the light of Israel turn to be the darkness of Israel. And that is why we come to this candlestick. For we are told that all of us have to produce a light corresponding to the light we have received according to the knowledge we have received so everyone of us should shine forth so that the people may give glory to our father which is in heaven and so the candlestick was so important in the sanctuary and just on the northern part we had the book the table of the shoe bread i mean the bread of his presence and the, on the southern part we have the candlestick in the center, just 
at the veil, we had the altar of incense. We have at least looked at the table of shewbread in some detail, and then we are at the candlestick. But then, why will the first article of the why will the table of shewbread be the first article? Then you have the candlestick in the sanctuary. The light that you shine had to be in correspondence with the word of God. And that is why in these three days we have dwelt upon having the word of God in our life so that we may not sin against God. When our lights go forth, it should be shining upon the word of God. We saw that Christ himself is the light and we are reflectors of the same. And so the candlestick in the sanctuary, the word and the spirit, how they are combined together is what we are going to look at this hour and then uh, um, I pray that the Lord will bless us. But um, we read that um, those who study the sanctuary, those who study the sanctuary, which is a compacted prophecy, should be able to understand more perfectly the Jewish economy because it is a compacted prophecy also. It explains the past, the present, and the future. But how shall we understand these articles of the sanctuary and the sanctuary well? We are told those who study this should be in this state. In TM 114, paragraph 1, together what? We have the word. And which is the word? Priceless gems are to be found in the word of God, and those who search this word should keep the mind how? Clear, never should they indulge in what? in perverted appetite in the eating or drinking. And how is this really actually related to the candlestick in the sanctuary? Because when you are coming to the candlestick to be able to shine, actually you have to partake of the table of shewbread. And uh, there is there an outlined dire to us so that we may be able to comprehend spiritual things because the candlestick is a only about spiritual things. The candlestick had the bowels of oil, and these bowels of oil, the priest lighted them. But this oil, when you go to the book of Zechariah chapter 4, it is passing through the pipes, which are the channels to the whole world, and you are one of the branches of the candlestick in the sanctuary. Amen? And so the oil, as it passes you, does the oil pass through a clean vessel or a dirty vessel? It has to pass through what? A clean vessel. What if the oil passed through a clean vessel? For those who have vehicles and motorcycles, if your oil actually is mixed with dirt, what happens to the pistons? They don't function optimally, is it? And so the pipes that the oil passes through, you who is one of the branches of the candlestick and you are the pipe, you must be a clean vessel so that the light that comes out, the functioning of the engine, which is the church, must be in accordance to what the Lord wants. And so those who study should keep their minds clear. And so in Zechariah chapter 4, we read, Speaking about this candlestick, and the angel that talked with me, Zechariah chapter 4, came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick of all what? Gold. A candlestick of all gold with bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. And the two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side. Continued on, he says, So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest not what this be? And I said, No, my Lord. Verse 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is what? The word of the Lord unto who? Saying not by, nor by what? Power, but by the, said the Lord of hosts. Now, 
the candlestick was the place of the spirit. The oil was the place of the spirit passing through this pipe. And uh, the Rubabel is being told that it is not by power, but by the spirit of who? Of God that this work will be accomplished because Israel was venturing into doing a work that had a lot of opposition. And what they needed at that point was the spirit of God. But the spirit of God could not come unto unclean things. No one puts the new wine into what? All wine skins. And the Lord wanted to cleanse them. That is why when you look at uh, Ezra chapter 9 and 10, and then you look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 13, we are told that Ezra and Nehemiah did a work of cleansing, separating them from these strange wives, and then they were able to be cleansed and do the work in the sanctuary. And that is what the Lord wants us wants to do unto us. He says that by the word that I have spoken unto you, you are how? Clean. So by the table of shoe bread, you become clean so that you may be filled with the sap from the vine who is Jesus Christ himself so that now you are candlestick or your branch may be able to burn bright and the people come into the light of God. Are we together? Are we learning? Let us learn together. Christ says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I'll give for the life of the world. Looking at this candlestick, the, the connection between the word and the spirit. You have Jesus Christ as the bread and um, that bread must be vivified, must be given the vital power, which is the spirit of God. As we partake of the word of God, it is spirit and what? Life. You cannot disconnect the bread from the life. Are we together? They have to go hand in hand. So we have the bread and the candlestick. This, this is what we are looking at. And so... Uh, Christ himself must revitalize this word that we have read. Him himself must revitalize it. You have actually, thy word is a lamp and a light unto what? My path. And so you have the two together. Are we seeing that? The word as a lamp and as a light also. We know that the light there represents the Holy Spirit because the five foolish virgins, they had the lamb, but they didn't have what? The oil which giveth the light. And so Christ himself giveth the light. And in John chapter 6, 63, it is the spirit that giveth uh, life. The uh, flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh will profit nothing. Jesus Christ says, if you eat of my flesh, you shall have life. But then John 16 tells us the flesh profiteth nothing. So the flesh without the spirit will profit nothing. So the flesh must be taken together with the bread. Are we together? While you are having the word of God, you should be asking of his spirit so that these two may go together. So you may not come up with your own interpretation of things. The reason why we are having a lot of interpretation of erroneous things is that we have the word without the life. We are content to open our Bibles, but without the spirit of Christ. In uh, 9 MR 113, uh, paragraph 2, we are told, the only safety for any of us is to plant our feet upon the word of God and study the scriptures. Making God's word our constant media meditation, tell the people to take no man's words regarding the testimonies, but to read them and study them for themselves, and then they will know that they are in harmony with the truth. The word of God is the truth. Of a good man, the psalmist declares his delight is in the law of, God, of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. That is Psalms 1-2. He who puts mind and heart into this work gains a solid, valuable experience. The Holy Spirit is in the word of God. Now, this is a very contentious uh, topic among us even uh, non-Trinitarians. But I'm not going to go into the controversy. I'll just read the quotes and uh, we, we think about them. Many people will want to have this disembodied spirit floating in them or about just. 
the spirit is not some other being walking around and feeling some people. I always ask people if the spirit is another being that walks it walks around and uh, uh, let us think for this or an evil spirit is another being or something that comes into the people, it goes around and enters into the people. Think about this. This is what I asked the people. Back in heaven, in the rebellion of Lucifer, which angel, fallen angel, entered into him called the evil spirit? Which another being entered into Lucifer to become Satan in heaven? If we say the spirit is another being just walking around to enter into people. It was a cultivation of selfishness that preoccupied the mind of Satan and he became an evil spirit. And so the way we understand the position of the evil spirit is the same way we should be understanding the position of the Holy Spirit. But then we continue reading. The Holy Spirit is the the Holy Spirit is in the Word of God. Here is the living and dying element so distinctly represented in the sixth chapter of what? Of John and she is talking about John 6, 63. And so the Holy Spirit is that undying element in the word of God. I want us to see how you cannot disconnect the articles of the sanctuary and how the candlestick is so connected to the table of the shoe bread. And so the word of God is the seed. Every seed has in itself a germinating word principle. In it, the life of the plant is enfolded. So there is life in God's word. Christ says, the word that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. John 5, 24. In every command and in every promise of the word of God is the power, the very life of who? Of God. And it is this word that has the life of God that will bring a distinct personality in you that will be able to bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We read on uh, that by which the command may be fulfilled and the promise realized. He who by faith receives the word is receiving the very life and the character of who? The character of God. And we know that uh, sanctify them by the truth thy word is. But then when you go to 2 Thessalonians 2.13, it says that sanctify them by thy spirit. So you cannot disconnect the two, the word and the spirit. God's holy educating spirit is in, in where? In his? Christ object lesson 132.2. A light, a new and precious light shines forth from every page. Truth is there revealed. And words and sentences are made bright and appropriate for the occasion as the voice of God speaking to the soul. Again, Sister White writing to Elder and Miss Essen Heskel. I want us to listen to this because as we look at the candlestick, we are looking at how it is related to the table of showbread and how the two cannot be disconnected, the word and the spirit. We cannot say today we have a new life that is not in the Bible. You hear people saying the spirit has spoken to me. But then we check in the word of God and it's not there. So should we follow the spirit that has spoken to the person or what is in the word? Talking to Elder S.N. Haskell and the wife, this is what uh, she writes to them in letter 132. And you can find the whole letter in uh, manuscript 21. Much is being said regarding the impartation of the Holy Spirit. And by some, this is being so interpreted that it is an, inch, an injury to the churches. Eternal life is the receiving of the living elements in the scriptures and doing the will of God. This is eating the flesh and drinking the blood of the Son of God. To those who do this, life and immortality are brought to light through the gospel. For God's word is verity and truth, spirit and life. It is the privilege of all who believe in Jesus Christ as their personal savior to feed on the word of God. The Holy Spirit's influence 
renders that word, the Bible, an immortal truth, which to the prayerful searcher gives spiritual sinew and muscle. So when you reach at the candlestick, the candlestick should be able to reflect that which is in the word of God. It should be able to shine forth to that which you have read in the word of God and nothing else. Such the scriptures Christ declares, for in them you think you have eternal life and they are there which testify of me. Those who dig beneath the surface discover the hidden gems of truth. The Holy Spirit is present with the earnest searcher. It is illumination shines upon the word, stamping the truth upon the mind with a new fresh importance. So when you, when I open the word of God like this in the uh, at the table of the shoe bread, and then I come at the candlestick, we are told that um, the the Holy Spirit is present with the earnest searcher, and it illuminates. It shines upon the word, stamping the truth which I'm reading upon the mind with a new and fresh importance. And so we need the Holy Spirit. We need the candlestick while actually we are studying the word of God. So um, she continues to say in, uh, in that letter, 132, let us believe the word. He who thus eats the bread of heaven is nourished every day and will know what these words mean. Need not that any man teach you. We have lessons pure from the lips of him who owns us, who has bought us with the price of his own blood. The precious word of God is a solid foundation upon which to build. When men come to you with their supposed supposition, tell them that the great teacher has left you his word, his word which is of incalculable, value that he has sent a comforter in his own name even the word the holy ghost again connecting the holy spirit or the candlestick with the table of shoe bread he says when the comforter come when he gives that spirit it shall not speak of it of itself or himself but what he hears and so what he hears is what is written in his word he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I'll give is my flesh, which I'll give for the life of the world. Now, speaking about the candlestick, and uh, in Acts chapter 5, verse 32, we are told, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so if also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. The power of the Holy Spirit is to enable us to obey the word of God. When actually we have the word, the only item in the sanctuary that can help us obey that word is the candlestick, which represents the spirit of God. Without the Spirit of God, you can do nothing. And so we need that art of the candlestick, which is the Spirit. It is not just enough to say that you have your Bible, to say that you have the truth. You need the candlestick or the oil uh, of the candlestick to be able to obey. And that is why they say in Acts chapter 5, verse 32, that the Holy Ghost has given them to obey uh, to them that obey him. And so, again, in our Christ Object Lesson, page 272, paragraph 3, talking about the empowerment of the Spirit of God to obey. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 7, 21. The test of his sincerity is not in words, but in deeds. The test of sincerity is not in words, but in deeds. Now, which deeds are acceptable before God? Which deeds are acceptable before God?
the only deeds that are acceptable before God are the fruits of the Spirit. And you cannot possess the fruits of the Spirit without getting the Spirit of Christ. You can try to manufacture good works, but if it is not Christ in you working to will and to do of his own good pleasure, then you will be just like any other person trying to do good but saying that there is no God. And so Christ does not say to any man, what say ye more than others, but what do ye more than others? Matthew 5, 47. Full of meaning are his words. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. John 13, 17. Words are of no value unless they are accompanied with appropriate deeds. And we know that the deeds are the fruits of the Spirit, and none can do the fruits of the Spirit unless the Spirit of Christ in them. That is why we are looking at the candlestick in connection with the table of showbread. And so the promise of obedience, they appear to fulfill when this involves no sacrifice. But when self-denial and self-sacrifice are required, when they see the cross to be lifted, they draw back. Thus the conviction of duty wears away and non-transgression of God's commandments becomes a habit. Now, let me just talk about this a little bit. If the Spirit is not the one leading you to do good, you reach at a point that you give up. Did you know that? Do you know that? If it is not the Spirit guiding you to do good, when you reach at some point, you fail. Why am I emphasizing on this? There's a point the brother made yesterday in the book of Luke chapter 4, and uh, I found it fascinating. That is the first time yesterday I saw it in its fullness, that uh, Jesus Christ was led in the wilderness by the Spirit. That is a statement we had, we have read so much. But in other versions, you find that he was led there with, by the fullness of the Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Ghost, which means that it is only the fullness of Christ that can lead us into the wilderness and we overcome it. And so when you reach at the candlestick, you have this Spirit, and this Spirit is Jesus Christ himself because it is light. In John 8, 12, we are told that I am the light of the world, and uh, if the light of Christ be in you in its fullness, then darkness cannot be there. And so uh, what we need is the fullness of Christ, that light in us to be able not to weary in doing good. You're just looking at the article, the candlestick. Now, in Acts, chapter, in, uh, Acts of Apostle 49, paragraph 2, Acts of Apostle 9.2. The promise of the Holy Spirit is not limited to any age or to any race. Christ declared that the divine influence of his spirit was to be with his followers unto the end. From the day of Pentecost to the present time, the Comforter has been sent to all who have yielded themselves fully to the Lord and to have his service. The men and women who through the long centuries of persecution and trial enjoyed a large measure of the presence of the spirit in their lives have stood as signs and wonders in the world. So when we receive of this oil on the candlestick, we are told we shall be spectacles to this world. Is it? We shall be like a city set on the hilltop and it cannot be done what? It cannot be hidden. We shall be spectacles. The reason why we can't be able to be set on the hilltop is because we have not received this fullness. But there is hope for every one of us because in Revelation chapter 1, we see Jesus Christ walking among us, the what? The candlestick. And his purpose is to give a revitalizing power to his church on earth. While he ministers in the sanctuary above in heaven, he is still a minister of his sanctuary on earth by his representative, the Holy Spirit, and not any other one. No one comes to fill the church but the one who was in the world overcame it, and now he can give that victory to his children by his spirit. In fact, if you read the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, how can we overcome this world the same way Christ overcame it, and how did, we, did he overcame, overcome it? Hebrews 9, 14, we read, how much more are we there, amen? 
how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the what? Eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God. Purge what? Your conscience from dead works to do what? So it is only the presence of the eternal spirit in our lives that will purge our conscience from dead works to serve what? The living God. We need that Shekinah glory. We need the candlestick. We need that oil, the Holy Spirit, to be able our minds to be made new. Let this mind that was in Christ be in you. It is by his spirit that this mind will be renewed unto holiness. And so we shall stand as signs and wonders in the world. The spirit of the Almighty is moving upon men's hearts and those who respond to it is influence become witnesses for God and his truth. Another thing we find about the candlestick, it was to be a witness and so we who have arrived at this article of the sanctuary, we can do nothing less but be witnesses of the things that we have witnessed at the table of the shoebread. The very things that we have read in the word of God, empowered by the candlestick or the oil that is in the bowels on the candlestick, we are to go forth to shine the light, to witness to the world. In many places, Consecrated men and women may be seen communicating to others the light that has been made plain to them, uh, the way of salvation through Christ. And as they continue to let their light shine, as did those who were baptized with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, they receive what? More and still more of what? And you can see that overflow in Zechariah chapter 4 happening. And the Lord can only fill us as we empty ourselves both of selfishness and both of his word. First of all, we empty ourselves of selfishness and then empty that word to others and then he can be able to refill us. Just as the high priest refilled the candlestick with the oil, so the Lord is seeking to refill us every day so that we may communicate the same to others. We are told thus the earth is to be lightened with the glory of who? Of God, And then I saw another angel coming from heaven with power and the whole earth was filled with the glory of God. Revelation chapter 18. And so in Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 to 4, as we try to bring this to a close, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to do what? What? Good tidings unto the what? He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable, the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of what? Virgins of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto who? Unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beautiful ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. And that oil is in the candlestick, and you are one of the branches on the candlestick. Christ being the main vine and the branches receiving the sap from him. They'll be able to accomplish what is needed at such a time as this. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. And they shall do what? Build the old west, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And this earth has been desolated for 4,000 years, is it? But now we are told that the light which shined in darkness have now to shine upon this earth in even a greater extent, with greater magnitude. Think about it, how God anointed Jesus Christ and how he went about doing what? Good, the book of Acts chapter 10, I presume verse 38. So in Acts 1, 8, as they were preparing for the day of Pentecost, what does he tell them? But you shall receive what? Power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. This is the experience we need now to receive the Holy Ghost, to receive Christ himself. And then we shall be able to be witnesses unto the uttermost parts of the world. The reason why we have had no influence a lot of the time is because we have not allowed 
to be influenced by the Holy Spirit. Many times when we say that we are being influenced by the Holy Spirit, it is just contrary to what we are speaking. Because if the, we are influenced by the Holy Spirit, we are told that our words will be accompanied by divine power and conviction shall be wrought among us the hearts of the listeners. Why is it that we preach and eat? people are not convicted even a minute? We are told that uh, this message, we should bear it until people can ask, what shall we do, brethren? But we can leave this camp meeting without even one person asking, what shall I do? And what does that mean? Some preachers were singing some good music to us, is it? It is because we come not ready to be benefited, but to question what we are hearing. It is not bad to question what we are hearing because we are told even the people uh, back then questioned Paul what he was, he was preaching. But if we come with a mind to receive the Spirit of God, then he shall influence us more than just to questioning, but to prepare us for the work that is ahead of us. And so those, who, those only who are constantly receiving fresh supplies of grace will have power proportionate to their daily need and the ability to use that power. Instead of looking forward to some what? Future time when, through a special endowment of spiritual power, they'll receive a miraculous fitting up for soul winning, they are yielding themselves daily to God that he may make them vessels meet for his use. Daily they are improving the opportunities for service that lie within their reach. Daily they are witnessing for the master, wherever they may be, whether in some humble sphere of labor in the home or in a public field of usefulness. Zechariah chapter 10 says, Ask ye the Lord of the rain in the time of what? The latter rain. Are we in the appointed time of the latter rain? Yes, we have been in the day of atonement for such a long time, and it is in the day of atonement that the Shekinah glory filled the temple, but we have been here for so long without that Shekinah glory filling the temple. It is a time that the Shekinah glory filled the temple that the work to be done must be done. Christ, our perfect pattern. Every worker who follows the example of Christ will be prepared to receive and use the power that God has promised to his church for the ripening of the earth harvest. We are looking at that angel that is come, come from the heaven with power and the whole earth will be filled with his blood. And we are looking at the connection between the word and the candlestick. We are to have his word and then we are to receive that power then it be manifested in us as the glory that fills the whole earth, then we can go and proclaim the same to the whole world. Morning by morning, as the heralds of the gospel kneel before the Lord and renew their vows of consecration to him, he will do what? Are we together? He will? Hey, how many are still with me? Few people. How many are lost somewhere? He will grant them the presence of his with it is what? Sanctifying power. As they go forth to the day's duties, they have the assurance that the unseen agent of the Holy Spirit enables them to be laborers together with God. And so Revelation 18 and the Spirit of God. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was done what? Lightened with his glory. And what is shutting away this power? We are told in 1SM 234.6. An unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and to accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at what? Minneapolis against the Lord's message through brethren E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. Unwillingness to give up preconceived ideas will never allow God to shower us with his Holy Spirit. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world as the apostle proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost. The light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted and by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. When we continue keeping opposition amongst ourselves, what we do, we are shutting out 
the outpouring of the latter rain. Think about it. How many years have we been in the truth, but it seems that the earth is not lightened up with his blood. It is the opposition among us ourselves. He says in another place in 1SM that uh, uh, the current movements are a feet full of untrained horses. One plunges forward and another one draws back. And when the master says, go forward, another one remains standing because people are not hearing the voice of the Lord. And that still voice of the Holy Spirit is not appreciated even in our times. And so in the Vian Herald, July 21, 1896, she says, the great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the whole earth with his glory, will not come until we have an enlightened people that how? Know by, experience what it means to be laborers with. When we have entire wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by an outpouring of his spirit without measure. If we will just move out of this thing that we have to be contending forever and have the missionary spirit, not sacrificing the truth. No one is calling for ecumenism or sacrificing the truth. But if everyone will go on their knees and seek the spirit of Christ, then we are told in 1888 messages, the spirit of Christ in you and the spirit of Christ in me will bring harmony and we shall be able to labor in the vineyard of God. But because the spirit of Christ is not in you and in me, then the devil brings this antagonistic power in us and we are forever contending amongst ourselves instead of going to accomplish the will of God, which means we haven't appreciated the presence of the candlestick amongst us and Jesus Christ moving in the midst. And so, and in a large degree, those degree through our publishing houses is to be accomplished the work of that other angel who comes down from heaven with great power and who lightens the earth with his glory through our publishing houses. But selfishness has occupied our hearts until we cannot give all as the Father gave all to the work to continue. And then we cannot be writing erroneous things to be spread all over the four corners of the world. We need the Holy Spirit to embrace the truth so that we may do that which is needed. Now, this is a call to every one of us, including me. In uh, Revealed Herald, December 30, 1902, I hope we can see the board. Who will answer? For the souls who have gone to the grave and prepared to meet their Lord. Have people been seeing darkness in you and me instead of light? Because in Christ, he was the light and in him, that light was the life of the world, is it? So if the candlestick shines as it should shine, then we expect people to receive the light and to come from their dead works to serve the living God. But if the candlestick doesn't shine, then what we have is darkness upon the world and the people will remain in their sins. So we should ask ourselves, you and me, have we been answering the purpose of God or have we been answering the purpose of the arch enemy? Christ offered himself as a complete sacrifice in our behalf. How honestly he worked to save sinners, how untiring were his efforts to prepare his disciples for service, but how little we have done and the influence of the little that we have done has been terribly weakened by the neutralizing effect of what we have left undone or undertaken and never brought to completion and by a habit of listless indifference. No one wants to do the work. And when the people come together to see how they can do the work, the only thing that preoccupies them is that, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? No one asks, have you received the spirit of God? But do you believe this? The doctrines are so essential to us that the spirit is never considered to be so essential. So, but how little we have done these things. How much we have lost by failing to press forward to accomplish our God-given work. As professed Christians, we ought to be appalled by the outlook. We need to be afraid of what we are accomplishing ourselves. I speak to you in words of what? Love and 
tenderness. Every earthly interest must be made subordinate to the great work of redemption. Remember that in the lives of followers of Christ must be seen the same devotion, the same subjection to God's work of every so, uh, social claim and every earthly affection that was seen in his life. God's claim must ever be made par paramount. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Christ's life is our lesson book. His example is to inspire us to put forth untiring self-sacrificing effort for the good of others. Without the spirit of Christ, we can do nothing. That is what we need most. The last two slides. It is not what? Your spirit that is going into what? It is whose spirit? It is not our manufactured light that is going to heaven. Let me rephrase that. But a reflection of that Christ, uh, Christ-like light. The light of Christ is the one that is to be reflected. And then we can get an abode in heaven. Will you have it? Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man do what? Hear my voice. Is it? As, he's as he is ministering in the heavenly sanctuary by his spirit, is knocking at the doors of the heart. And he says, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him. He wants to fill us as it is in Zechariah chapter 4. As it is in the candlestick, when the high priest came to fill the bowels with the oil, so Christ is impatient, by the way, waiting to fill us. Then I ask, how is it that so many of you are saying you do not know whether you are accepted of God or not, that you want to find Jesus? Don't you know whether you have opened the door? Don't you know whether you have invited him in? If you have not, invite him now. Don't wait a moment. Uh, open the door and let who? Jesus in. Not the mysterious other God that will think, will make you think you are doing the will of God when you are not doing it. Lastly, we read, and this is a blessed promise to us. Think about what the Father wants to do unto us in TM 518.2. Can we read this together? I rejoice what? In the bright prospects of the future. Do you rejoice? And so may you also be how? Cheerful and do what? Praise the Lord for his loving kindness. That which you commit what? He loves you and does what? Pities your every weakness. He hath done what? With all what? Spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And in John 3.34, he says that he whom God sendeth, he uh, gives him the spirit without measure. If Christ is wanting to send us, then he cannot give us the spirit with measure. He wants to give us the spirit without measure. Last, let us read the words in red. It will not... The heart of the word. To give those who love his son a word. Then he gives his son. Amen. And it pleased the father that the fullness of the Godhead should do what? Dwell in him. And that is what we want him to accomplish now. He is desiring to do that. May the Lord bless us. Shall we pray? Our Father, which is in heaven, we want to glorify your name once again. It is not our light that is to shine, but your light, Lord, a manifestation of your own spirit in us. And so we pray that, Lord, with the longing hearts that are kneeled before thee, may you do your wonderful work of imparting your spirit to your children, not in a mysterious way, but in the way you only understand it, a way that, Lord, will help us to conform to the duties of the congregation on this day. We praise your name of all that you have done for us and the things that you are intending to do for our lives. And we pray that, Lord, as we shall be moving from this place after the come meeting, that uh, the power of heaven shall be manifested amongst us and your glory shall fill the whole earth by these people whom you have appointed to do the last work on this earth final history. Bless your people. And guide us during this hour and the remaining period of this camp meeting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.